Catalysis is critical for the selective generation of one of a pair of enantiomers and reactions that convert an achiral starting material into a chiral product. One example of a reaction that does this is shown for you here. It's an ester hydrolysis process starting from a substrate that contains two esters. The starting material is achiral. It contains a plane of symmetry that includes this methyl group coming out of the screen. The plane of symmetry is about here. But the product is chiral, and we can see that if we notice that one of the esters has been hydrolyzed. So we've broken the symmetry. The group I'm highlighting in blue is not identical to the ester group on the right. We have an acid on the left and an ester on the right. Ester hydrolysis can be accomplished by an acid catalyst in water, and when we use H2SO4, the acid catalyst is achiral. The use of an achiral catalyst together with this achiral substrate leads to a racemic mixture, a 50-50 mixture of the two possible enantiomers. So the two possible enantiomers here would involve the methyl group either pointed out towards us, that's one enantiomeric structure, or the methyl group pointing away from us, that's the other enantiomeric structure. The product contains one stereocenter, that's this stereocenter here, and the wavy bond just indicates a mixture of these two products, more specifically, a 50-50 mixture of the two possible enantiomers. Why are the two enantiomers generated as a 50-50 mixture? Well, let's draw out their specific structures so that we can get a little bit of a better handle on this. And I'm going to do some abbreviations to simplify things a little bit. So one of the products contains the central methyl group pointed out towards us, while the other enantiomeric product has the same backbone structure, if you will, with an acid on the left and an ester on the right, but the methyl group is pointed away from us. Both of these molecules are chiral, and they are enantiomers. Another way to draw the second product involves turning it over. Turning over the second product moves the acid group to the right, the ester group to the left, and swings the methyl group from a back pointing position to a forward pointing position. So this is the same structure we just had, just flipped over. These are still enantiomers because all we did is change our perspective. But what this helps us see is that the difference in the formation of the two enantiomers is which ester group reacts. When the left-hand ester group, which I've highlighted in green, reacts and undergoes hydrolysis, we get the first product with that group hydrolyzed. When the right-hand ester group reacts, which I've highlighted in blue, we get the second possible product. So the essence of the difference here is which of these two groups gets hydrolyzed. Now, what's the stereotopic relationship between the two ester groups? Well, they're related by the plane of symmetry, reflection interconverts them, and if we applied the Q or substitution test to this substrate, we would see that the Q test would give enantiomeric Q structures. That means that the ester groups are enantiotopic. Their relationship is similar to the relationship, for example, between your two hands. The achiral catalyst can't tell the difference between these enantiotopic ester groups. It reacts with both of them at equal rates. And so 50% of the time it will engage with the blue ester group protonating this carbonyl oxygen, and 50% of the time it will engage with this ester group protonating the other oxygen. This results in a 50-50 mixture of products, or a racemic mixture. Now this is typical. This is the typical situation when an achiral reagent engages with a substrate containing enantiotopic reactive groups. However, the situation changes dramatically when we turn the acid into a chiral catalyst. In other words, when we introduce a stereocenter in here so that the overall structure lacks a plane of symmetry. So say, for example, we took the achiral sulfuric acid and turned it into a phosphoric acid derivative where now we have a chiral structure. Two stereocenters, no plane of symmetry. The catalyst is now chiral. In fact, we have a similar situation to the one we just saw. Two possible enantiomeric products exist. One is drawn on the slide, and the other one, which I'm drawing down below, involves hydrolysis of the ester groups. And the difference between these two products is which ester group gets hydrolyzed. When the left-hand group gets hydrolyzed, highlighted in green, we end up with the product drawn on the slide that's been turned into a carboxylic acid. When the right-hand group gets hydrolyzed, which I'm highlighting in blue, we end up with this other enantiomeric product. These are the same products that we saw in the previous slide. 
Now that the acid catalyst is chiral, it can tell the difference between the enantiotopic ester groups. In the same way that a chiral pair of, say, right-handed scissors can tell the difference between your left hand and your right hand. A right-handed pair of scissors feels better in your right hand. And likewise, a chiral catalyst with this configuration reacts selectively with one of the two enantiotopic ester groups. The chirality of the catalyst is key because now, when the catalyst gets together with the substrate, we generate a pair of diastereomers rather than enantiomers. So even though the products are enantiomers, in the course of the reaction mechanism, when the catalyst is involved, we're dealing with diastereomeric structures. This is what ultimately leads to the selectivity. And so in contrast to the previous case, we might end up with 90% of the enantiomer provided on the slide and only 10% of the minor enantiomer. In the same way that if you put 100 pairs of right-handed scissors down in front of 100 people, 90 of them would pick up the right-handed scissors with their right hands, and 10 of them would pick up the right-handed scissors with their left hands, maybe the 10% of lefties in the crowd. This is how enantioselective catalysis works. The catalyst is able to distinguish between enantiotopic groups, and this leads to the generation of enantiomers because the catalyst is regenerated in the course of the mechanism. At some point, the conjugate base of this acid catalyst is protonated to regenerate it. And this is great because this means we only need a substoichiometric amount, a relatively small percentage relative to the number of moles of substrate used to make this enantioselective reaction work. Chiral material in a enantiopure form like this as a single enantiomer is precious and rare and expensive, so using catalytic amounts of catalyst is great. Nature is exceptional at enantioselective catalysis. It's so amazing in enantioselective catalysis that we don't even worry about it. Biochemists don't even worry about stereoselectivity. In an enzymatic context, selectivity is very commonly greater than 99.999%, as many nines as you want, effectively. The reason for this is that enzymes are not only chiral biological catalysts, but create extremely selective pockets for a single enantiomer of substrate or product. And so only one enantiomer of a possible product or only one enantiomer of substrate fits into the enzyme active site pocket and engages with the enzyme and reactivity. So enzymes can distinguish between enantiotopic groups. They can form a single stereoisomer selectively. They can react with a single stereoisomer in a pair selectively. And you can find numerous examples of enantioselective and diastereoselective reactions in the metabolic pathways of living systems. One great resource to explore this is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes, where you can look at metabolic pathways, and when you do, you won't see any of the other enantiomers that are not formed. Just to give one quick example of this, this molecule can be converted via an enzyme along with ammonia or an ammonia surrogate and a reducing agent like NADH into an amino acid, and this occurs with amazing stereoselectivity to give only this product. Only the product in which the central stereocenter has this observed configuration. This is S. None of the R enantiomer is formed in the active site of the enzyme that catalyzes this reaction. That's because the active site pocket is chiral and it fits only this product within it. And it's able to deliver the ammonia and the reducing agent such that this product forms selectively. Only this configuration forms. We'll see enzyme catalysis in more detail in a future series of videos, but I wanted to mention it here because enzymes really are nature's enantioselective and diastereoselective catalysts.